We're just days away from the general election, and we want to have one of our most interesting guests on today, Governor Ben Cayetano, who's running for mayor. And he's been in the news almost every day. We want to welcome him for taking time in the final moments of the campaign to come and speak with us about everything that's happened. Welcome back to the show, Governor. Thank you, Malia. It's a pleasure. It's been an exciting election season, huh? Exciting and dirty. Dirty, definitely. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about that. You, um, you came back out of retirement to run for mayor. You were governor from uh, 2000, for people that, uh, from 1994 to 2002, for people that might be watching right. this mm -hmm. uh, from other places besides Hawaii. And, um, we, and, and you came back out of retirement after about 12 years, right, to run for mayor. Now, um, maybe just to give people a reminder of why you did that. Well, you know, I, I, I studied rail for a very long time. And when I saw what the city had proposed, which is what I dealt with when I was in the, in the state legislature, Frank Fossey proposed a rail project at that particular time, and, and we studied it. I felt that uh, uh, we need to be very careful because uh, we have a very small tax base here. And from the very beginning, I felt that we're too small to support a project that's probably gonna cost about $7 billion. And I was waiting for someone to run, but none of the young guys wanted to do it. And so finally, uh, you know, I felt uh, we can't let them have a free ride. And so that's why I came out of retirement. Now, a lot of the young guys might not want to be involved with this because you've had to take a lot of heck for running, huh? You've had to take a lot of uh, dirty campaigning and dirty ads about uh, against you. So you want to, let's talk about that. Where are they coming from? They're coming from uh, PRP, Pacific Resource uh, Partnership, which, by the way, is a trade name. It's not a legal entity as such, you know. Uh, they're, not, they're not filed with the, the Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs. It's a trade main for the Carpenters Market Recovery Fund, and the money is coming from there. We don't know who the members are. It's, you know, their identities are, are, are not known, and uh, PRP will not uh, let the public know who these people are. And that's where the money is coming from. I estimate right now they've probably spent about nearly $2 million in, in uh, radio ads and TV ads, just wrapping me, you know. And uh, also, they have people who are canvassing. They pay these guys $400 a week to go out and distribute uh, uh, brochures and leaflets, uh, some of which are very critical uh, of me. Uh, and um, they, they're a very sophisticated uh, ground game. And I think that this cannot be a local company because I've never seen any local company that has the resources, nor the expertise to do this kind of stuff. It must be a, a mainland company. And I think that uh, uh, one reason why so much money is being spent on this, because some big contractors and big special interests have a real stake in, in seeing that this rail project, which is likely to cost at least $7 billion, uh, that it will be built. Because they see making money, uh, land development, and so many other kind of things. Nothing to do with traffic congestion. So there, and there's also um, a public relation or a public relations and advertising company involved here locally as well, right? Uh, okay, so how you we've not just seen radio and TV ads. You said there's a ground game, and there's also calls coming into people's homes. Um, talk about that a little bit. Well, you know they they, they have this push pull, and the push pulls are very actually quite uh, devious because they pretend to be uh, a, a regular poll, and the 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 idea is to through the, the, the questions you ask the person on the other side of the line to drop negative information about the target, which is, in, is me. And uh, they've done that. They started doing that uh, really early on. I think in May they started. In fact, you, you traced one of the companies down to Idaho, was it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, so push balls are very uh, devious. They were, you know, they, 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 they're meant to elicit a certain kind of negative uh, response to uh, information that's given about about candidates. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I actually heard one of those calls, and and they said a lot of um, things in, in the, about you know your past, and and they try to they're try they're trying to sway the the person calling not to um, necessarily say what they really think. It's just a matter of you know they want to push all their thoughts on you, and that's that's what really that's what it really is, and it's all negative, and it's all positive for Kirk Caldwell. Yes, and you know. Uh, I think the best example of a push poll uh, was during the uh, Dukakis uh, campaign. When Michael Dukakis ran for president, 
uh, there were rumors about his, his wife being an alcoholic. And so the push poles would basically call people and they would talk about issues and then he would say, by the way, uh, uh, it is said that Kitty Dukakis is an alcoholic. Does that, will that make a difference in your vote? Well, maybe to most people it wouldn't, but the, the, the seed, the, uh, the thought is planted in the person's mind. And, and so that's, you know, that's I think the first time it was used extensively. Well, people I talked to were pretty appalled by, you know, getting those polls in their home, and they were they weren't um, they weren't affected by it. But you know, you just don't know. I mean, it's a it's a it's just one tactic that they're pushing against you. Let's just really quickly and not waste too much time on this because we don't want to give uh, any more credence to what they're saying. But can you address each point real briefly that they're accusing you of? Like, um, for example, they 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 started off with um, this thing about illegal contributions that you knowingly took illegal contributions and that. Um, Maybe can maybe can explain that. You know, it, it, what they've done is that they've they've uh, you know distorted the facts to 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 make a point. But on the so-called illegal contributions, uh, the former uh, uh, executive director of the uh, executive director of the campaign spending commission, who really was the architect of our campaign spending laws, Robert Watara was so upset by it, he flew in on his own money uh, to test to to basically uh, tell the press and the people. Uh, that, uh, you know, what they were saying was a bunch of lies and, and that I had never done anything wrong. An opinion, by the way, shared by the Campaign Spending Commission uh, lawyer and uh, the State Attorney General. State Attorney General at that time, Mark Bennett, Attorney General under uh, Governor Lingo. So despite, despite this, and despite the fact that uh, the local news pundits, uh, such as yourself, uh, uh, David Shapiro, uh, Richard Baraka, Ian Lynn, uh, Cynthia Oy have all come out to debunk the, the rumor. They continue to, 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 uh, to press it, and that's why they're being sued. Uh, lately, they came up with another uh, uh, really low-life added, if you ask me. Uh, they claim that I gave uh, more pardons uh, than any other governor, which is true, you know. Uh, they said, I pardon rapists, which is untrue. I never pardon any rapists. But anyway, uh, but what they didn't tell the people is that the only reason I gave more pardons than any other governor is because I had the most applications. So when you take a look at the percentage of pardons that I gave, uh, I'm like 50% or 51%. Uh, John Burns is like 70%. Ariyoshi is in the 60s, and I think Wahe was 72%. The only... Uh, Governor uh, lower than me was Linda Lingo at 22 percent. They leave those kind of facts out, and you know it. Uh, uh, it's really hard to uh, you know come up with a rebuttal because oftentimes nobody listens to the to the rebuttal. Right, they just hear the negativity. Right. right? Yeah. Um, they also talked about what, what what were some of the other issues that we, so we can just get it aired out the, about the um, I think it was about teachers union or something like that. Well, you know they they accused me of uh, of. Uh, causing the teacher strike, and the, the reality is that uh, we couldn't afford what the teachers wanted. Uh, first of all, you know, why in the world would I want to get the teachers mad at me? Uh, but the teachers wanted a contract, I think it was for 240 or 260 million. I told them we couldn't afford to pay it because we were uh, in a tough economic situ situation. We, we offered 98 million, and then they said they're going to go on strike, and so they went on strike. The teachers chose to go on strike. The teachers' union chose to go on strike. I didn't cause that strike, you know. The only way we would have avoided the strike is I had to pay them what they wanted. And if I paid them what they wanted, we would have to cut people on welfare, we would have to cut social programs, which are very important to especially people who are, you know, the very needy you know, in, in, in our community. And I wasn't about to do that. So you took this whole attack uh, campaign that's going on at you from being on the defensive, now you're on the offensive in a sense because you've filed a lawsuit, and can you, you mentioned it for a second ago, but could you explain why did you do that and um, what, you know, what people should expect? Well, we did it, first of all, we, you know, there was a time when I felt, okay, since, uh, you know, the, the newspaper columnists and uh, the Campaign Spending Commission uh, and Robert Watara and people like that came out and say, it's not true, uh, we thought it would stop. And for a while it did. And then after the primary, they began ramping it up again and with uh, commercials which are, which are really uh, insidious, they actually uh, suggest that 
I kept the money, which is really uh, bullshit, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's uh, it, it's such a, a fabrication that it really kind of boggles my mind that they, 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 they're going to do it. But they don't care. They don't care. They don't have any honor. And they're very, very shameless in what they're doing. And so I consulted with uh, uh, Jim Bickerton, who probably is the, the top uh, lawyer here on uh, defamation cases, and Michael Green, who is one of the top trial lawyers, and they are both representing me now because uh, they did the analysis and they felt that even though uh, our country, in our country, we give people the right to speak freely and criticize their politicians, you know, that's part of the, our society, uh, still, when they do it with malice, then that speech becomes defamation. And we feel that they have crossed the line, and that's why I filed the lawsuit. Now, Kirk Caldwell, he, who is your opponent, and he's backed by Pacific Resource Partnership and many of the unions because he's pro rail, um, mentioned the other day. He said, "Well, I would have been. I was at a press conference, you know, at the event where you both spoke, and mm -hmm. afterwards he mentioned, well, I would have thicker skin." And then everybody said, all the reporters said, "Well, are you trying to say that the governor should have thicker skin?" And he said, "Well, I would have thicker skin. I'm not going to tell the governor, you know." But what, what is your thought on that? You know, Kirk is playing this game, I mean, you know, really, and really it kind of speaks to uh, a, a candidate's character as to the level that he would, let, would stoop to win an election. Uh, he says that, well, you know, I don't have anything to do with uh, what PRP is doing. Well, yeah, but they're using his photo, and they're using Dan, Danny Noe's photo, and he doesn't even have to say anything to them. All he has to say to the public that I don't condone or, and I disavow this kind of campaigning, you know. But he won't because he knows that uh, he's the beneficiary of it. And when you talk about thicker skin, nobody has ever uh, accused me of co committing a crime before. You know, and uh, uh, that, I think, I would not take from anyone. Yeah, that crosses the line, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, let's go. Um, uh, and is there anything you want to talk about in, as far as their accusations or anything else that came up? Otherwise, I want to talk to you about why, a little bit more about why you're running and really get into the... Okay, we can get into that. Is that good? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so you've already talked about rail, but maybe go into your bus plan. We actually haven't had you on the show since you unveiled your bus plan, uh, your B ra bus rapid transit plan. Well, we, we call it FAST, you know, which is uh, flexible... Uh, uh, <laughs> Affordable. Flexible, affordable, Smarto. smart transportation. Transportation, right. And the, the plan is a comprehensive plan. It not, not only includes at the center of the plan the bus rapid transit system, it includes many other things. You know, we, we, we uh, go, propose some underpasses at key intersections. It doesn't cost a lot of money to do these things. Uh, we, uh, we're going to use uh, uh, country flow lanes, uh, and we'll run buses, express buses, uh, from the central and, uh, and uh, leeward areas uh, uh, where the buses pick up people and they don't stop until they, they, they get downtown. They get on the zip lane, they go 50 miles an hour while the train is stopping every, uh, you know, uh, three minutes. Uh, we feel that it's a much more affordable plan because we estimate it, it'll cost about maybe one-fifth the cost of rail. Uh, and it's flexible, so if a route doesn't work, then you can either alter it, you can make some changes, but you can't do that with rail. And the thing about rail is that it uh, recently the, the Federal Transit Administration uh, commissioned a study. They call it the Porter Study. And the Porter Study, the purpose was to analyze the city's ability to finance rail. And basically it said, okay, if Everything you know uh, comes in as planned. If you get the 1.5 billion dollars, if you get the ridership that you're talking about, or you're, you're forecasting, uh, if there are no cost overruns beyond 10 percent, uh, you, you know all of that, uh, then you can finance real. But they also the caveat that a lot of people miss is that the city would be able to finance real under those circumstances, but it would have to undergo uh, a 9% in, uh, decrease in non-transit funding. So transit funding, which is bus right now, would go from 10% of the city's budget to 19%. Well, that extra 9% is 200-something million dollars. And when you look at the, uh, the, 
the uh, annual operation uh, budget of the, the fire department, that's a little over $100 million. You could wipe out the fire department, you know, to, to make up for that, uh, that, that $200 million. Nobody's going to do that because we need fire, the fire department. The point is that it, rail now is clear to the public that it sucks up the city's resources and ability to carry on other services. Yeah. Well, we keep hearing from Kurt Caldwell that, oh, he can, we can afford all of it. Kurt Caldwell has never run a, 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 really run a government before. He, he, you know, he's, he seems to have no sense of, uh, of, uh, of uh, fiscal integrity. Uh, I'm surprised at all the forums we've, we've been to. One, at one time, I, 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 you know, I said, Kurt, you need to bring an adding machine because he proposed all kinds of things and you never tell the people what it's going to cost. So in one speech, he promised the, the, um, the firemen and the, and, 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 and the policemen that he would make sure that they have all the resources that, 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 uh, that they need. Well, I would hope that the firefighters and the policemen, my, my grandson is a firefighter, would take a look at the Porter study and mull in their mind, okay, what from that 9% less for non-transit funding is going to come out of the fire department or the police department. The alternative, you got to raise taxes. And that hurts uh, everyone. But Kirk is accustomed to raising taxes because when he was managing director, he proposed increasing the real property tax to 9%. And the, the, the city council said, no, uh, we'll get it down to 5%. Raise the, the uh, vehicle registration tax. Uh, even increase the, the uh, admission fees for children to the zoo. <laughs> he, he's accustomed to, to that. We'll have to ask Big Bird what he thinks of that, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, you know, that's, he, he was actually, as you say, managing director, and he was briefly mayor. And he talks a lot now about wanting to fix all these things that he could have fixed before. Do you think, what do you think about that? Well, I think that uh, he could have done it before. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even though two, two years or so is a short time, he could have started. And the trouble is he didn't start because he was focused on rail. I find it interesting that, uh, that now he and Peter are, are you know, are, are buddies. Peter Carlisle. Peter huh? Carlisle are buddies. When during the primary election, he was going after Peter Hammer and Tong, accused Peter of, uh, you know, he said, you know, Peter, we, uh, when I was uh, managing director, we got rail to the one yard line, and now you neglected the job so much, it's back on the 50 yard line. Mm -hmm. Now yeah. these two guys are holding hands and they're buddies, you know? And, Ma and Mayor Carlisle has endorsed <coughs> Kirk Caldwell now. Right, you know, because he's, uh, he's for rail. Right. I mean, that's what it, it's, it's funny how this, this election really is about so much more. You know, you've mentioned power and money, who's going to be controlling the city, who's in charge, is it the people versus the power? But everything comes back to that rail because, as you mentioned, it's an 800 pound gorilla in the room, right? Right, and you know, um, it, it, it's going to affect everything. Yeah. And so I tell people when I go to the forums, I, I tell uh, people, you know, your uh, uh, bi monthly sewer and water fee, uh, rates uh, by 2017, only five years from now, uh, will increase for a household of four to $396. And people's eyes pop, you know, because a couple weeks ago on KITV, there was a story uh, with the Board of Water Supply receiving six to 700 calls a day from people who say they cannot afford the increase in the, in the sewer and water fee. And it's, it's really sad because according to the report, some of these folks are trying to asking the Board of Water Supply whether they can do it on an installment plan and all of that. You know, you'll never, you'll never catch up if you, if, you, if you pay that on the installment plan. But for senior citizens, $396 uh, every two months is a lot of money. Yes. Especially since now they may be, be, be paying maybe $200. Kirk and before him, Peter, that doesn't even occur to them, you know. And one of the, one of the things that I had to do, and maybe it really shaped my, my fiscal values, when I was chairman of the Ways and Means Committee and later as governor, is that you see the bigger picture, you know, you're gonna build something, you need to, to see how is this thing gonna affect everything else. 
And I think the difference between Kirk and I is I see it from my experience, and he does it. One of the points that you've made is um, that there's almost $15 billion, $15 billion with a B, dollars worth of infrastructure to repair, and that we cannot afford to put something else on top of that, like a rail. Maybe you can just briefly mention what that's about. Well, you know, um, just to upgrade the sewers is, is going to cost about $6 billion. Billion, not million. And to upgrade the water system, approximately $6 billion uh, as well. And the roads, which are ranked the third worst in the nation, 1.6 billion, so that's roughly uh, almost 15 billion, as you uh, as you say. Uh, these are tremendous costs, you know. And I, I remember when the city was sued by the the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, and the cost then to upgrade the sewers uh, that that the EPA wanted uh, amounted to one billion dollars. And Senator Inouye said that'll bankrupt the city. You know what it is now? 4.7 billion. You know, and I don't, I don't hear Senator Inouye saying that's going to bankrupt the city. So why, why is it, make, why does it make sense to put on top of that debt that future generations, uh, you know, are going to have to deal with uh, a rail project that's going to cost between five to seven billion dollars, and not only that, which will likely cost, uh, well, according to the city, is going to cost 632 million dollars. A year to to just operate, you know, uh, that's a lot of that's a lot of debt to put on uh, the citizens of a city, which has uh, which is ranked the the third most unaffordable city in the nation. We get the highest gas taxes. We have our electricity rates are ridiculous. They triple the national average. Everyone knows that it costs a lot of money to live here. So why would we? Why is it wise to put something that's going to make it more uh, costly to live here? And really price out some of our retirees and especially our young who go to the mainland to go to school and all of that. Why should they come back? You know, first of all, our jobs don't pay as much as the, they do on the mainland. Our houses are much more expensive than the mainland. Why should they come back to a city that's going to be so expensive to live in? And there's signs everywhere that the city's crumbling. We have wa one water main break a day, right? 300, according to the Board of Water Supply, average 364. So nearly so one So we a get day. one day off, maybe Christmas, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, let me see. I think there was actually a, a break outside my sister's house last Christmas. So I guess we don't get Christmas off. But um, And then there's the, the sewers we've had going to the Alawai, and, and they're still trying to, uh, with all the sewage in the Alawai in 2006. But we still have problems with sewers and cost overruns with the sewers getting repaired and well you know uh, the sewers uh, it's not a so-called sexy political subject yeah? but it's critical to the prosperity of the city because you cannot develop you cannot redevelop areas which maybe are old and run down if you don't have the sewer capacity and you know you all you have to do is uh, drive down Eisenberg Street and you take a look at the area there and you look at the stadium uh, bowl. It's been sitting there for nearly 20 years. Uh, it should have been sold and redeveloped, but nobody wants to do it because you've got to upgrade the sewer system. If you, uh, let me take another example. If you drive down Kapiolani Boulevard heading east and you look at to the left from Macaulay to Date Street, you see all these walk-ups, two-story walk-ups. They're old, they're wooden, and you have to wonder, well, how come they, nobody's building a new uh, condo or apartment building, or uh, why isn't the city or the state uh, building uh, affordable rentals? It's just sewers again. You need to upgrade the sewers. So if, I, if I, I'm in, I'll go in there and talk to the private developers and say, we're going to upgrade this place, but we'd like to work with you so that we can develop a redevelopment plan, give you some incentives, uh, density incentives, for example, allow you to go maybe a little higher and a little wider um, so that you can develop part of it, but we also want to develop affordable rental units for the people who need it. Yeah. Right. There's a lot of people who can't afford to live here. 
Well, you've had um, support from Republicans, Democrats. You're, you're a Democrat, obviously. You've been a Democrat, uh, hard, you know, very staunch Democrat for all these years. But you have you have a lot of support from different people. You've been criticized for that, for getting uh, independents, Republicans, conservatives, liberals. Um, all you know, Democrats have all come together to support you. But you're getting criticized for that. I just wanted you to address that. Well, it's just another tactic that they're using. You know, I mean, they're they're, they're reaching for anything that they can throw at me. And uh, you know, um, this is a nonpartisan election. I'm getting support from Democrats, Republicans, conservatives, liberals, libertarians, you name it, independents. They've all come together. And most of us don't agree on many other things, but we agree on the city's uh, future. And uh, I have taken the position that I'm not going to endorse anyone because I need to respect the non-Democrats who are supporting me. You know, Everyone knows that I'm a Democrat and from my past track record over the 28 years that I serve in public office, they know that I'm a pretty strong Democrat. And I, I don't think it's any secret that, I'm, that I would probably vote for President Obama. You know, mm -hmm. But I'm not going to run saying who I'm going to vote for or who I would like to see in office because I need to respect people who have come forward to support me. Right. Um, do, we're almost out of time, but I wanted to ask you real quick about Senator Inouye. Why do you think it is that Senator Inouye is so passionate about this rail to the point where he's put his reputation on the line for it? Yeah, he's, uh, he said it's going to take World, World War III to, to stop rail. And I, you know, I think that World War III was declared some time ago against yours truly. Yeah. I respect the senator. You know, he's done a lot for the state and, uh, and, and for our country. And, uh, you know, I, he endorsed me. Uh, in my 94, 98 uh, gubernatorial elections, he did some commercials for me. But I think that uh, on this particular project, he's invested so much of himself in the project. And I, sometimes I get the impression that it's more about him than the project itself. Because when we try to get information to him, to tell him our side of the story, that this may you know, cause real hardship to, to people who don't make a lot of money, uh, he has never met with us. He has never... Uh, listen, you know, he has put his faith in what the city and what the Federal Transit Administration tell him. And I think that uh, when you do that, it, uh, you know, that's a kind of uh, uh, blindside uh, uh, perspective that uh, uh, is not good for any politician. I think you need to take a look at both sides of the coin. And, uh, and I, again, I think that he's invested so much into this. Uh, that his personal pride is at stake. Yeah. And we should never, every politician should be willing to swallow if their pride, if the circumstances require it. And I think the circumstances require that. Okay, so well, I just wanted to tell everybody they can check out more about you at um, Ben for, what was it, the website? Vote, VoteBen2012.com. VoteBen2012.com. And we don't believe anything that comes out of PRP Hawaii or Pacific Resource Partnership or any push polls, right? Right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having and me. And good luck. Thank you very much. This has been News Behind the News. Aloha.